Hi, I'm Simon Bamford, and you're listening to the Barker Cast. All right, well, hey, welcome to episode 177 of the Clive Barker Podcast. This is live from uh, Texas Frightmare Weekend. Yes. yes. The Southwest Convention of Horror. And I'm Ryan. Ryan, whoa. I'm Rob. And I'm uh, Jose, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're very tired. Yes, it's been a crazy weekend. Yes. But yeah. fun. But fun and worth it. Yeah, uh, we got to meet Clive Barker. We got to take a photo with him. We got to re- do a Cenobite uh, interview. interview, which you'll be seeing on a different episode. Uh, there's a Cenobite panel that's going to be in this episode. And we spent a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> We did, oh, we did another interview. Maybe we'll keep that one a secret for yeah. a little while. Yeah, we won't say that one right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But we're excited about it because yeah. it's not something that uh, you would expect. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So it's been exhausting but exhilarating, like I said in my Facebook post. And uh, meeting Clive was really special. Um, for me and for Rob, we had never met him before. I mean, I, I had been at the Cabal Director's Cut uh, screening at the Crest Westwood years ago, but I didn't get a chance to talk to Clive or anything. So Ryan has met Clive several times, of course, over the years in conventions since he was in high school. Um, so, you know, but it was interesting to see Clive Barker come back uh, from from uh, several years of not even being able to deal with the fans uh, in conventions, and now he's, he's here, and he's been here for like the last couple of days. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's exciting. As we're recording this now, it's Saturday. Um, Jose and I, we've got one more day, or part of a day. And then I'll be Rob, leaving in the morning. Yeah, Rob's going to be on his way out. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think most of we got most of the stuff done that we wanted to do. We've got, I feel like, four or five episodes worth of content. Yeah. Uh, so um, I was very happy with uh, all the stuff we got. Yeah. We're suffering from... Con crud and con depression right yes. now. Yeah. I think. Yeah. So, but uh, it's it's fun, and we're gonna take home some very treasured memories Definitely. and some very special items that were signed by some very special people, and I'm very happy about that. Oh, and we also had a we also had a live like listener party uh, screening of Bard of the Blood Lama. That was that's gonna be an interesting commentary. Yeah, hilariously oh, terrible, and there were confusing. A good, we we suckered about ten people into watching that horrible <laughs> movie with us, yeah. uh, with food and and uh, Dos Equis. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, um, and and uh, yeah, we want to thank again Joe Manco, Catalina Carita, Miglio. Uh, uh, Ah oh, man, I'm forgetting some names. Uh, 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 Crystal uh, uh, Von Gul. Yeah, yeah. Red Von Gul um, and and uh, Katie, Katie, Katie Irby. Yeah. Lots Katie. of people who Thank were with you, us, and they helped us to to make this this con- convention something really special. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much for all your help and all yeah. your partnership in this. You really made this. Uh, you really made the grade for us. Yeah. yeah. We traveled a long way. Um, I was almost thwarted by a duck. <laughs> <laughs> a duck hit Ryan's plane. Yeah, a duck went into the engine, and um, before I was on the plane, and then they had to spend an extra hour and a half cleaning it before cleaning it, hosing the duck out of the airplane. Robbie expecting... got to. Robbie got to fly for the first time. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it was an interesting experience. Takeoff is the, the funnest part of yeah. flying. The rest is just like sitting in a cramped seat with no leg room and just uh, yeah. hearing people cough and sneeze all over the plane. Yeah. I like landing. And yeah. for some reason, I always think after you land, you get, people are just going to get up and go out of the plane. But it's always like 15 minutes before you oh, leave sure. the doors. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, super fun. We got to meet Max Lichter of the Pyramid Gallery. We got to meet Derek Neal of Configuration Boxes. Maz, Maz, uh, Maz Watkins. Yeah. Maz Watkins. Um, um, uh, her friends, all of her friends. And uh, it was a really fun time. And tomorrow we're still going to try to fit a few more things, me and Ryan. So. Yeah. Oh, and we got to wow. meet Lori Markle Bechet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got to talk to her about Simon Banford, and she got to geek <laughs> yeah. out, and we got to see her. Her outfits that she was cosplaying with. Yes. Yeah, we have a lot of cool pictures too. Yeah. We took uh, down here. So we saw the Cenobite panel today uh, at like uh, one in, one in the afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. 
We saw your, your appraisal by uh, uh, Nicholas Vince. Yeah. It's his latest short. Yeah. Uh, it was really, really cool. And uh, we, we basically just spent a lot of time in line. Yeah. How, how many hours did we spend in line for Clive Barker yesterday? It's like seven, I think. Seven, seven hours. hours. Yeah, seven gotta, hours in line. Pain and pleasure, oh, indivisible. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it was worth it, so I'm not yeah. complaining. But yeah, it was, it was fun. It was really, really fun. Crazy times. And, and, um, really tired. The Cenobite panel was done, was videoed professionally by Little Spark Films, Joe Menko and Catalina Carrada, and they were awesome. They were amazing. Thank we, you guys. We've never had had a production production value like that before, and I can't wait. They're editing it for us, yes, and they're going to send it to us. So it's not going to be in this episode. It'll be like maybe two episodes from now. You will put it up on. Um, it'll be on YouTube, and we'll share that link with you guys as soon as we got it. And it'll be an audio podcast, but I think. In this case, I'd advise everybody to watch it rather than listen, but we'll yeah. put it on audio anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, with all that said, we're gonna uh, we're gonna go into the uh, dis- the duels of blood discussion. The final four round is over, and we're going into the um, the the what do you call that? No semifinals. The, no, the final four round is starting. Yes. It's yeah. Starting. I, I don't know what I'm talking about. It's late and I'm tired. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, we finished round four and we're going into the final four. And um, so that'll be exciting. We had we actually discussed that live with the ten people that we also tricked into watching that horrible llama movie. <laughs> so Oh, another thing I got to experience, which was cool, uh, I got to see Hellraiser on the big screen at the... Alamo, Alamo Draft House. Alamo Draft House, and it, they were, the, there was a... Q and A panel with uh, Doug Bradley, uh, uh, Barbie Wild, uh, Nicol- Nicholas Vince, and Simon Bamford, and it was really cool seeing Hellraiser on the big screen. It's a much different experience. And Paul T. Taylor was there yeah, in the was, audience. He, showed, yeah. he actually asked a question. <laughs> what was the question, Rob? Uh, it was about uh, which what play would uh, they most like to see made me made into a big production? Clive Barker play, right? Yeah, Clive Barker play. And they mentioned Frankenstein in Love. Yes, Frankenstein in Love. And then Doug Bradley pointed out and said to everybody, do you guys know who that guy is in the back? <laughs> yeah. yeah. He said it was, uh, well, that's Paul T. Taylor, the new pinhead. So yeah. it was pretty cool. It seemed like to be yeah. like this kind of like a, uh, a bonding of uh, yeah. between the two pinheads. And I'm so, looking uh, at my messages, and I just heard that Paul T. Taylor got to meet Clive today on the second day of the convention. So that that's, awesome. that's exciting. And Simon Bamford brought cookies to uh, to Paul T. Taylor from England, yep. which was exciting. We got uh, we got to we had them all together in our in our panel discussion, the private one that we made ourselves with the little spark films. Yep. And um, they were great. They were all great together. Yes. And for people that think there's some kind of rivalry between Doug Bradley and Paul T. Taylor, there's not. No, at all. We keep saying this, but there was they were they were not competing for that part in Hellraiser Judgment. So right, they, right. They don't have any ill will towards each other. No. Uh, Some people think it's going to be like in uh, tra- time travel movies when you uh, <laughs> go back in time and see yourself, and if you touch yourself, you're, you're going to destroy the universe. <laughs> Nothing like that happened. Yeah, no. Everything was really, really nice. Yeah. And uh, Paul T. Taylor has been accepted in the Cenobite family. Uh, so you'll see that on the upcoming panel that we recorded with the Little Spark Films. Yeah. And I think you guys are going to enjoy that a lot. And... Um, I, I was meant to go to that Hellraiser screening and Q&A, but because of the dub, yeah, uh, I didn't get to go, and, and Rob went on without me, like a trooper. That was uh, <laughs> a whole other story I can share about my own personal experience of getting, <laughs> getting lost in <laughs> yeah. downtown Texas, not yeah. knowing where I am, but I had a, 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 friend, a friend I made down here get me through it, so... You know, I'd like to give a shout out to Katie Irby for helping me that yeah, night. That really that was helped. great. Yeah. All right. 177 of the Clyde Barker podcast. Uh, we are going to be, uh, we're live here at uh, Texas. All right. Everybody make some noise. Woo! Here we are. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, on the eve, I guess, of, of Texas Frightmare Weekend, we're going to be headed there in a couple hours. Yeah, yeah, we're going to be doing that, and now we're just sitting on our Airbnb uh, house, and we're ready to do a small episode about the uh, Duels of Blood. Yep, and then we'll add in some other stuff that we do over the Texas Frightmare 
All right. Shout out to Joe, who's around here somewhere. Hi, guys. Hey. Hi, Joe. Joe from Little Spark Films. Hi. There you go. Uh, so, so what do we got here, Ryan? Uh, Walk me through it. Okay. So, I guess, oh, yeah, it's right there. Um, we got uh, Dr. Shenard versus Pinhead in the Duels of Blood at www.duelsofblood.com. Uh, the votes are in, and Halty Taylor must have really gotten a lot of, uh, a lot of his fans. Yeah. Yeah, Paul won. Paul won with 67% of the votes. Is this the last day? It is, yeah. yes. Yeah, last night at midnight it was. Oh. At midnight Alaska time. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, he, his, his, uh, his round had the highest number of votes out of everybody. Uh, you know, I, it, that's not surprising considering Paul T. Taylor has been sharing this uh, website on his Facebook page. and uh, he, he paid for an ad on Facebook. He did? Yeah. It was sponsored? Wow. Yeah. Good job, yeah. good job. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. Somebody yeah. Paid. Well, yeah, I don't know that it was him, but I know somebody paid for it. So he got 3,528 votes against Dr. Chenard, who just had 1,756 votes, but yeah. still a decent turnout for Dr. Chenard without anybody, like, promoting it or anybody, like, asking fans to vote for him. Yeah. I think it shows that Chenard still has, like, a lot of fans out there. Um, you know, yeah. from Hellbound, who's going to, Hellbound's going to turn uh, 30 in December this year, I think. So I that when Paul T. Taylor would boast about this, all the comments would be like, yeah, Dr. Chouinard sucks. <laughs> and I, I don't agree with that. I mean, I don't right. some of his lines, but I think he's all right. Yeah. The doctor is in. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, doc- amputation. Yeah, rent amputation, right? So uh, yeah, that's the first one. Uh, Pinhead from Judgment, Paul T. Taylor, he won. Uh, and then the next round is interesting. It's uh, the the Skeletal Puzzle Guardian, uh, created by Floyd Hughes, the storyboard artist for Hellraiser one and two. And uh, we, you know, the randomizer put him up against Pinhead, uh, our favorite Hell Priest. Yeah, yes. And you know, unsurprisingly, uh, Pinhead won. Yeah, right. I actually thought he would even have. Yeah, it's kind of the under under skeletal dog, I guess. Um, so that's not a surprise there. But what I'm really afraid of is the next round. If we're going to have a pinhead from Judgment versus pinhead from Hellraiser, or should I call him classic pinhead? Yeah. And then pseudo pinhead, which I don't know if he's got like a publicist or something. Why does this keep happening? He's like great value pinhead yeah, right there. Yeah. 1,686 <laughs> votes. Who are these people? How did he make it that far? I don't know. He made it further than, uh, was it Revelations pinhead? Yeah. So that's, producers did the wrong thing there. Yeah. He's, got, he's got American cheese oh. staple to his <laughs> That's what it looks like, yeah. That's a terrible makeup design. But luckily, Barbie Wilde's female centibite from Hellbound won, which I'm, I'm happy because I was afraid to have to, to be able to talk to her about this if she lost to him. So, but yes, yay Barbie. So yeah. Moving on, finally Pseudo Pinhead who beat a bunch of people who he should not have beaten. Right. He's finally gone. Is gone. And uh, uh, it was close though. I mean, the... the Female Cenobite from Hellbound had uh, 52% of the vote, and Pseudo Pinhead somehow got 48%. I don't know. Whoever it is out there was voting him for him, boo, shame on you. <laughs> you guys have terrible taste. But, you know, moving on to the last one, it's uh, Skinless Julia from Hellbound again uh, versus uh, uh, Lori's favorite buttery dumpling, <laughs> yes, right. Simon Bamford's Butterball. Do you think she likes Simon Bamford? Yeah. I think so. <laughs> I think. Don't we all? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think she's bringing him a cake or something. Yeah, and... Uh, That's right, yeah. So, yeah, Butterball, uh, kind of like the silent, strong, silent type. He never really says a word in, in the movies. He just gets the ceiling, falls on his head, and that's it. He was supposed to have lines, but his oh. costume wouldn't allow it. Oh, really? He, he talked about that last yeah. night at the... Uh, Oh, oh yeah, it was something really weird. Perhaps he, we were he what he was supposed to say, but he couldn't. He couldn't make the piece out because his lips wouldn't come together. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. right. Perhaps we prefer you. Was, yeah. So there was another line too. Oh, it was like really silly line. Hmm. I, mean, I don't remember what it was. Can't remember what it was. Maybe we can. Bitty. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there you yeah. go. 
So, yeah, uh, maybe that's on the, the script. Maybe we can look at the script uh, and see if that is in there somehow. So, cool. Uh, Skinless Julia, who won the Duels of Blood, like, the second time, I think, right? Uh, yeah. Volume 2? Yeah, right. She, round, she won round one, and then we made her, like, a bonus round in two, and she beat... Mendelssohn. No, I think Mendelssohn won't beat her. To be fair, it was Julia, not Skinless Julia, right? right yeah, yeah, it was uh, Claire Higgins. This one was played by uh, Deborah. What was her name? Uh, Deborah something. I forgot the actress. Yeah, she was a really skinny woman, and they used that skinniness to apply the entire body makeup. Um, it wasn't like Little John the stunt butt for. Julia. He was yeah. in that scene where Dr. Chouinard is running his hands up uh, Julia's uh, really? legs. Really, That's that is Nicholas Vince's hands going up, oh, yeah. and and the legs were this kind of like pant-like fixture uh, appliance that Little John from Image Animation had on. Yeah. So there's a picture behind the scenes of actually uh, <laughs> Little John and Nicholas Vince. Yeah, there is one. Mm-hmm. We'll have to find that and put it on the show notes. That's like the second time he's been a. Uh, He was. He was uh, the hands that come out of the grate and grab uh, um, uh, Lori. Yes, yes. So that's it. And uh, now we're going to move to round four. Is that four, Ryan? Yes. And just this morning, I did the randomizers. Final four. Yeah, these are randomized, so you can't blame us for these matchups. Blame the internet. It's uh, interesting. Yes. So Butterball is going to be going up against uh, Judgment Pinhead. Okay. so Ooh. what that means is that the two characters that have people actively campaigning for them are going to be up against each other. Yeah. So we're going to probably see like 10,000 votes on that. Match. That's going to be fun. Yeah. That's going to be fun. And then um, the female Cenobite, uh, Barbie Wilde female Cenobite versus <laughs> Doug Bradley Pinhead. All right. That's uh, also going to be a tough one. Oh. Sure. Yeah. That's... Uh. Who to vote for, right? It's As you're oh, listening to this yeah. on Sunday, that will already be up and you, you can vote. I think we should have four winners this time. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wins. Everybody wins. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. Um, so, yeah, that's the Duels of Blood. And when, yeah. when does the new round of voting begin? Uh, right now, as you're listening to this on Sunday. So, okay. Yeah, cool. Alaska yeah, 8, 8 o'clock a.m. Alaska time. Time, right? <laughs> right, right. Everybody, yes. Uh, of course. So that's it uh, for the Duels of Blood. And stay tuned. Uh, we're going to do the coverage of the Texas Frightmare weekend over the entire weekend. So keep your eyes on our page. Yeah, well, and actually, we'll be putting some of that in this particular episode. So, yep. like, right now. Hey, so this next part is the Hellraiser p- panel from the Shockwaves. Uh, podcast they were moderating. It's the Texas Frightmare Weekend official Hellraiser panel. Uh, so obviously these questions aren't ours. We had our own Hellraiser panel, which I'm very proud of, and you'll get to hear that in the upcoming weeks. But this is the uh, the public one. So anyway, um, the questions weren't ours, and of course, and and um, the sound quality is not super great. You know, we recorded it from the audience, uh, but th- here it is. <laughs> I'm Dr. Rebecca McKenzie. I am a co-host of the Shockwaves podcast and a professor of art at USC. And I need this. And let's bring out our esteemed panelists, guys. Welcome to the panel. I am honored as hell to be doing this. Um, Hellraiser was by far one of the most influential things in my life, so much so that it is tattooed all over my leg. Um, Let's start by bringing out Simon Bamford.
sit behind the table and people in black cotton would throw money at you and say, <laughs> and, and say it's only nice things about you. It's really hard work. <laughs> um, and, and she was she was getting more and more interested and, and really, really okay, okay. And I said, well, I'm about to go out to America to do a show called Monster Mania, uh, which is Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Big show. And I said, well, I promise you, if I go back home and email Dave Hayden, who promotes the show, and tells him you're interested in doing it, he will be turning back for us. Uh, she said, okay, please do that. So I did. And Dave replied in about three seconds, basically saying, fuck yeah! <laughs>
once, once long ago, <laughs> in a city far, far away, um, uh, called Liverpool, uh, in England. Uh, and when I say a long time ago, it is nearly 50 fucking years ago. <laughs> it is probably time for me to be able to die. I was, I was at uh, high school in Liverpool, and uh, my mate Jimmy Hughes said to me, I'm going to be in the school play. And I thought, fuck you, if you're going to be in the school play, I'm going to be in the school play. So <laughs> uh, I went up to Bruce Prince, who was directing the play, and I said, sir, I want to be in the school play. And he said, oh, do you? Okay, well, read this, which was the role of Bob Chinsky in Public Inspector by Nikolai Gogol. And he said, okay, you're in school play. So I walked into rehearsals, and uh, there was this, this um, fellow pupil, of whom I was vaguely aware, um, who was also in the cast of the school play, and his name was Clive Barker. Uh, so, um, after school and university, we were doing experimental theatre together in Liverpool, subsequently assigned and mentioned the dog company in London, uh, which broke up in 1982. Uh, I was doing provincial rivalry theatre. In 1985, a party uh, which was held by Jane Wild Goose, who subsequently designed and made uh, the Seven Bites costumes and the double dog work with the dog company. Uh, Clive said to me, quote unquote, I'm trying to put together a low budget British horror movie. And I think there might be a part in there for you. That was uh, autumn fall 1985. So a year later, uh, that part you thought I might be interested in was the set by without a name. Um, uh, and we were crippled with production village starting work on Hellraiser. That was that was my route to Hellraiser. Now, how much um, character did Clive give you going into these parts? Like, did you get backstories, or were you just kind of handed the costume? Did you kind of find out what what the character of your particular cinema was? Um, I, I, Clive talked to me about um, the possible as being a torturer of the group, which is why he had a great big belt on his head. has some beautifully designed torture components on that, which you've never really seen. Of course, lots of stuff designed. Good. In our eyes are amazing, in our eyes have never really made the screen, which was a great shame because it was beautifully made. Um, and I think the idea was that I would be the one kind of taking the scalpel to people and pulling their tongues out and um, actually eating out their eyeballs. But of course, it didn't need any of that. Because they saw the visuals of what the characters looked like. I mean, they applied being the other man, and he has realized that the less was more because I think it was better, it was far more powerful. If these things are just happening without just having some You just have this fairly disgusting relationship with your belly button. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a big kind of vagina room. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was really deep. I was a skinny, skinny, 23 year old, I think, when we made it. And uh, they wanted somebody skinny in it because then I could get my whole hand inside this room to be playing with this. I, I apologize, I'm very sorry I mentioned it. <laughs> 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 it was one of the few things that actually didn't make the cut because they decided it was too, I don't know, I think too erotic, but um, too gross to have somebody actually having kind of pleasure in themselves with their hands. <laughs> <laughs>
does it, do they ever explain, um, do you ever find out why it's constantly chattering? Like, what is that? It can't, yeah, it's, it's said that it was um, the idea of the sound of the chattering, the monkey, um, the monkey that chatters its teeth. That was the idea of the monkey, right? And then it's only after we've done the film that you would point out as an amazing thing that you can do. You realize that the heart of the inside of the top. So I was 19 years old, they didn't know the surgery on my face. So I was born on the shop to play my top jaw on the system of my head, like a while in the top of And during that uh, operation, sorry, so during our operation, Show 
you know, eyes and mouth, but the, everything had to be concentrated in the eyes. And so between the novella, You're Dead, and knowing that the only thing I really could use and manipulate were my lips a little bit and the eyes was the, that was uh, sort of where the character came from. And Doug, how much background did you get in Pinhead, and did you know about Captain Elliot Spencer and kind of his big, long life history before you started? Uh, do I answer your last question first? No. Um, you know what uh, Hitchcock's answer was when he was asked, what's my motivation? Uh. Your paycheck. <laughs> So the apron on the front of the costume was originally intended to be one of those chain link metal aprons that butchers use so they don't slice themselves open and they're cut up the panels. He told me uh, that I was a surgeon in a hospital, but it was a hospital that had no wards, only operating theatres. And that in addition to being uh, the man who wielded the knife, I was also the administrator. I was responsible for making sure that everything ran to schedule. Um, so that, with that, was, that was the idea that began to develop, which, which is fairly strong with, with, with Penhead, that he's, he's fairly rule-bound, he's fairly contained and up and down, surprisingly, for a soul-tearing um, angel demon. Uh, he also introduced me to a publication called Piercing Fans International Quarterly. Um, this, was, this was in the days prior to body modification and um, body jewellery being as, as widespread and prevalent and uh, even, dare I say, commonplace as it is now. And this was fairly extreme stuff. This was people slicing and dicing. Um, the most intimate parts of their anatomy, all parts of their anatomy, including the most intimate bits. So, um, I suppose I could have taken the Daniel Day-Lewis method <laughs> and proceeded to slice my penis in half. <laughs>
of what I thought was going on with the calendar in those 20 minutes. I, perhaps it's all the research you can do is just to have that looking back at you and try raising an eyebrow and frowning a bit and then try saying, um, you know, I'll tell you a certain part and it all seemed quite fun to me. Uh, I also had a sense of it being melancholy, a sense of loss, a kind of emotional deadness about him. And I, I link that to the idea that he knew he had been human, but he couldn't remember it. Uh, which also really makes sense of why he's so fascinated by human beings. So 
saw it. Kind of big. I kind of grow old. Nope, nothing he said. Okay. This went on for about 10 minutes, and by the end of which, I was good in my way. I was useful. Nope. Okay, so he's not going to move his face. He can't really move his body. It's a the costume. Uh, all I've really got is my tongue. So that's why he sticks his tongue out. And, uh, the final bit is our fingers would be dipped in blood, and I would have, we would have um, these false teeth, which would be molded to fit our teeth, denture fixed on top of our own teeth. At which point we couldn't close our mouths and cry, because neither of us could breathe through our noses. We had to breathe through our mouths. So for hours on end, there'd be Nick and I sitting in the corner going. <laughs> Thank you. 
trying to say, we can't hurt me. We can't hurt me. And then I could hear the bit going, oh. Ow! <laughs>
skirt, the apron, the jacket went over that. The jacket was corseted up the back, so it was tight. Um, the collar was tight. This was all stiff. It was made out of proper aviators leather. It was serious gear. Um, uh, and then the, the, the flaps of skin, which were on the latex, were hooked uh, over each other.
So this one is just uh, us saying hi to Clive during the, the, the Clive Barker cast photo op that we did. Um, it's on the, the front of this, um, of this particular podcast episode. It's the, it's the, the art for this episode. 
Okay, and then this one is just my short little uh, inter uh, interchange with Clive Barker uh, during the signing. So Clive wasn't feeling good, and they had told everybody in line we we're just doing a sign signature, not personalized, and not going to really have conversations or anything. We're just going to try to move everybody along because Clive's not feeling good. So it's not. This is not much of anything. It's not like an interview or anything, but it is something you know. It was still nice, and I want to. I want to put it in here. And here I asked Phil Fondacaro. Um, he he was in uh, the Yattering and Jack. Uh, he's uh, he was the Yattering in the TV adaptation from Tales from the Dark Side. So he was there at Texas Frightmare Weekend. Um, and so I you know I wanted to, he's been in a lot of movies. Uh, he's he's got a had a pretty prolific career. But I wanted to talk to him about the Yattering and Jack. Uh, so I did. I talked to him just a little bit. Um, so here's that one. While he was signing my Land of the Dead Blu-ray, I had it. I talked to him about that. What's that? Yeah, blue is great. Thank you. Um, I'm with the Clive Barker podcast. You were in that um, that adaptation of the Yattering and Jack, yeah, back in the early '80s. Yeah, how was that? Yeah. Was was that paint? The red was that red paint? Yeah. Oh. You have a story. Oh. Okay. Oh gosh. How how many hours did you have to be in that? Oh, gosh. Wow. I got you. Yeah, yeah. Did, did, was Clive Barker visiting the set at all? I think it's been once or twice. Oh, okay. Just to make sure that the reality was what he wanted. Oh, okay. Uh, but I didn't get to spend too much time there. I think it was the director and getting me. Oh, yeah. Oh, I bet. I enjoyed that part very much. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate it. It was nice to meet you. Oh, and we're going to get a picture. Yes. Yeah. And that's it for this episode. Uh, we're going to have a lot more cool stuff coming from F Texas Frightmare Weekend in our time there uh, over the next, I think, three more episodes. So um, stay tuned for that. Okay, thank you. And this podcast, having no beginning, will have no end. Find the show notes for this episode and join the discussion over at www.clivebarkercast.com where we have news and links to all the ways you can connect with us. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and every other place you can find podcasts. The Clive Barker Podcast is an independent editorial podcast and news blog that is not affiliated with or under contract by Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.